This is Moscow, and today is a dream come true. For many years, I've longed to visit the Soviet Union to bring you a first-hand report on fellow Christians here. Now, thank God that time has come. In this eight-part series of telecasts, we'll take an unforgettable tour of this remarkable land. It all begins today. It is written. This is George Vandeman presenting as the answer to your deepest needs, the living Christ. Today from the Comrades in Christ series on the heritage of Soviet faith, a dream come true. This is the heart of Moscow. Across the river is the Kremlin, which is adjacent to Red Square. The building with onion-shaped colored domes is St. Basil's Cathedral, one of the many churches near the Kremlin. Would you believe there are 14 of them? 14 churches right here at the headquarters of the Soviet Union. Of course, all of them became museums under communist rule. Yet despite the prevailing atheism of the past 70 years, these magnificent cathedrals have borne a testimony, silent yet powerful testimony to the religious heritage of the Russian people. Now there's a new yearning for the ancient faith. And surprisingly, religion is respectable again. Thanks to the policies of perestroika, the restructuring of society under President Mikhail Gorbachev. Across the Soviet Union, there's a tremendous revival of spirituality among Christians, Muslims, and Jewish people. So during this series of eight telecasts, as we get to know our Soviet brothers and sisters, I'm sure we'll find much inspiration for our own faith. Now you understand, I'm a United States citizen and praise and I praise God for my land of freedom. But I've noticed that Soviet Christians are equally patriotic for their own homeland. So shall we set aside our political differences and cherish what we have in common? Let's focus on the faith in God that binds our hearts together. After all, we're comrades in Christ. Let's begin by taking a get acquainted tour around Moscow, the Soviet capital, starting right here in Red Square. This square is a vast open space paved with cobblestones more than a half mile long. Behind me is St. Basil's Cathedral with its onion-shaped towers of green and red and blue and glistening gold. On the opposite end of the Red Square is the dignified Red Brick State Historical Museum. To the east is the Goom Department Store, largest of its kind in the Soviet Union. Lenin's tomb is an imposing structure of polished granite honoring the founding father of the Soviet Union. And just behind it is that ancient fortress, recognized everywhere as the Kremlin, headquarters of the Soviet government. The Kremlin is surrounded by a high wall about a mile and a half long. Five watchtowers loom over it, each topped with big red stars that glow at night. Now, 12 streets branch out from the Kremlin into the city of Moscow. Most famous is Gorky Street, a broad tree-lined boulevard lined with stores and restaurants and bookshops. One of Moscow's proud landmarks is its main subway station, almost rivaling a palace with its beautiful mosaics. A subway takes us to the agricultural fairgrounds with its spectacular fountain and flower gardens. On another subway stop, we find ourselves looking up at Moscow State University. It's on a hill overlooking the river. Finally, we come to that famous Olympic sports complex Lenin Stadium that you've seen so often with sports events from Moscow. Of course, there's more than tourist attractions in this vast city of nine million people. Moscow has mile after mile of factories and crowded apartments. Beyond the city in the green birch woods are the pleasant country homes of government leaders, and scientists and artists. No doubt about it, Moscow is a remarkable city. Its history is equally impressive, going back more than eight centuries 
to a wooden stockade built on a river bank. And the roots of its religious life take us back even farther. Christianity sprouted in old Russia in the year 988. It's an intriguing story that transports us to the Ukrainian city of Kiev. At a picturesque spot along the banks of the Dnieper River, the Grand Prince Vladimir was baptized more than a thousand years ago. His conversion to Christianity was a startling development in a violent, hedonistic lifestyle. Vladimir had even murdered some of his own relatives. He also killed two Christians who refused to sacrifice to his pagan gods. Now, Vladimir knew better. He'd already encountered the claims of Christ through his godly grandmother, Olga. Her prayers for him seemed wasted, however, until Vladimir surprised everyone and announced his conversion to Christianity. Now, the Grand Prince may have had more than piety in mind in becoming a Christian. You see, the Emperor Basil II in Constantinople had promised to give Vladimir his royal sister Anna in marriage if he accepted her Christianity. But beside this compelling motivation, Vladimir needed religion to unify the pagan tribes under his leadership. He explored and rejected Islam, Judaism, Roman Catholicism, before choosing Eastern Orthodox Christianity. No doubt Vladimir was impressed by what his representatives found when they visited Constantinople, headquarters of the Eastern Church. Tradition has it that the splendor of the Cathedral of Hagia Sophia, with its 10,000 flickering candles and gold mosaics, staggered Vladimir's men. They reported, we knew not whether we were in heaven or on earth, for on earth there's no such splendor or such beauty. And so Vladimir proclaimed himself a Christian. After his baptism, he immediately moved to Eastern, to establish Eastern Orthodox Christianity as the official state religion in the lands under his realm. He even issued a decree stating, whoever fails to come to the bank of the Dnieper River tomorrow to be baptized, will be my enemy, be he rich or poor, beggar or slave. Well, the next day, multitudes came and watched the Grand Prince arrive with a procession of priests. And as the priests chanted the liturgy, Vladimir ordered his people to wade into the water and get baptized. It was a milestone in the history of Russia. Well, at first thought, this mass baptism might seem to be a wonderful event. The people have been pagan with the yen for human sacrifice, and now by order of their government, they became baptized Christians. Unfortunately, individual conscience didn't seem to matter to the Grand Prince. He meant well, no doubt, but the Bible teaches that people should be free to choose for themselves about getting baptized. We see this from what Jesus said in Mark 16, 16. He said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. You see, we must believe in order to be baptized. This obviously requires the freedom of personal choice. Forcing people to be baptized is no different than making them get married. People have a right to their own choice, don't you think? The history of Christianity in Russia as well as in Rome reveals the sad results of enforcing faith. Whenever the church influences the government to make religious legislation, freedom always suffers. The union of church and state in old Russia ultimately helped topple the czars, paving the way for atheistic communism to outlaw religious influence. Some of the same factors were at work in the atheistic French Revolution, remember, of the 18th century. And in the United States, we take pride in our religious freedom. And I thank God for it. But you know, we too have had serious problems with religious oppression back in our colonial days. Few of us realize how our spiritual roots were riddled with intolerance. Several hundred years ago in the American colonies, unbelief was a crime. Faith was enforced by law. Believe it or not, certain religious offenses were even punishable by death in our own country. Now, that was before the American Constitution, with a Bill of Rights guaranteed religious liberty. But 
Bible prophecy predicts that the future will bring a reversion to religious oppression. We'll talk about that later in this series. If you want a preview of what's ahead for the next few weeks, I have something for you now. Our new book, Comrades in Christ, is full of vital and fascinating information about Christianity in the Soviet Union. And there's no obligation. It's our gift for you today. At the close of the telecast, I'll tell you where you can call or write for your copy. Church history shows us again and again that government must not interfere with religious matters. Now, certainly civil morality must be enforced by law and order, or else murderers and robbers and rapists would ravage society. But when it comes to personal religious expression, the conscience cannot be compelled. Every individual must be free to love God or withhold their love from Him without interference from government. Notice what Jesus taught in Matthew 22, 21. Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. So things that belong to Caesar, civil government, and things that belong to God, religious matters, must remain separate lest we begin to return to the days of religious persecution. Well, now let's return to the story of Grand Prince Vladimir. St. Vladimir's Cathedral in Kiev was nearly destroyed during the Nazi invasion of World War II, but it survives today. Under Vladimir's forceful leadership, the Slavic tribes united into a political power headquartered in Kiev. Meanwhile, 700 700 miles to the south in Constantinople, trouble was brewing with Rome. The religious rivalry between Constantinople and Rome had its roots in events of the fourth century. You see, way back then, several hundred years after Christ, the Roman Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity. His experience was quite similar to Vladimir's of Russia. Both had been pagans, enemies of Christianity, who experienced sudden and dramatic conversions. But both leaders forced religion on their subjects. Constantine marched his soldiers into the sea to be baptized. Then, seeking to Christianize the Roman Empire, in the year 321, he declared Sunday the national day of rest. You see, the seventh-day Sabbath of the Bible had already fallen into neglect in many areas, but Constantine made it official. Eventually, a compromised form of Christianity became the official state religion. Not long thereafter, the Church of Rome began persecuting all who resisted her teachings. Now, how did the Church become powerful enough to persecute? That's the question because it filled a vacuum in leadership created when Constantine moved his capital from Rome. And seeking to escape economic problems and the threat of invasion by barbarian tribes, the emperor relocated 800 miles east, establishing Constantinople as his capital, now, of course, Istanbul, Turkey. From that time onward, the western part of the empire was dominated by the bishop of Rome. Eventually, the city of Rome did fall into barbarian tribes and then into their hands. The church, however, managed to Christianize the invaders, thus maintaining the control of the Western Empire. And to the east, Constantinople remained secure for a couple of centuries. Then came fierce raids raids by Muslim armies, and one of their massive naval assaults is said to have involved eight 1,800 ships? Imagine, way back then, the Christian defenders counterattacked with a terrifying secret weapon weapon known as Greek fire, which burned more ferociously in water than on land. Now, the exact formula for Greek fire remains a secret to this day. It wrought terrible havoc among the Muslim attackers. Their forces were defeated. Constantinople remained in Christian hands for the next 700 years. The church in Constantinople, however, had no secret weapon in its spiritual war with fellow Christians in Rome. 
The dispute between the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches centered around the pontiff's claim to have supreme authority over all Christians. They argued over other matters as well, among them the Seventh-day Sabbath. Rome was determined to eradicate Sabbath-keeping throughout Christendom. You see, centuries after Sunday became the law of the empire, little pockets of believers still worshipped on the Bible Sabbath. We have record of Sabbath-keeping in areas as diverse as Egypt, France, Turkey, Palestine, Syria, Italy, France, and Yugoslavia. And evidence indicates that in Ireland, St. Patrick kept the Seventh-day Sabbath. Now, you may find this surprising as I did. In many places, both Sabbath and Sunday were honored. The Eastern Orthodox leaders had no problem worshiping on Sunday, but they protested Rome's insistence upon making the Sabbath a day of gloom and fasting. They said such abuse of the Sabbath had no foundation in Scripture and seriously altered the intended character of the Sabbath as a day of joy. So Pope Leo IX refused the reforms demanded by the patriarch at Constantinople, and tempers flared. The pontiff dispatched his representatives with an official document denouncing Eastern Orthodox Christians as living on a level with the devil. The patriarch didn't appreciate Rome's assessment of his character, and not surprisingly, the pope and the patriarch excommunicated each other and their followers, resulting in what we have known as the Great Schism. This separation between Rome and Constantinople began in the year 1054. For the next nine centuries, the Roman Catholics and Greek Orthodox shunned each other. Now, in recent times, they have resumed dialogue, but their basic incompatibility remains Rome's determination that the pontiff be recognized as supreme authority over Christians everywhere. You may find yourself wondering, what does the dispute between Constantinople and Rome have to do with religion in the Soviet Union? We're back in Moscow now, and as you know from watching the news, the Russian Orthodox Church finds itself at odds with Roman Catholics. The roots of this misunderstanding can be traced to the Great Schism of 1054. The Grand Prince Vladimir, you recall, had aligned himself with Rome's rival, Eastern Orthodox Christianity. How then did the Ro Russian Church wean itself from the influence of Constantinople? Well, to begin with, Vladimir wanted to nationalize the Church of Russia, making it the powerful preserver of national identity. His son, who succeeded him, Yaroslav the Wise, took his father's efforts even farther. Yaroslav determined to make Kiev the rival of Constantinople. Now, that never happened. The invasion of Mongols from the east forced the Russians to move their capital to Moscow. But through the unifying influence of national Christianity, Russia emerged intact from the 240-year domination of the Mongols. This reign of terror finally ended in 1480 during the rule of uh, Tsar Ivan the Great. The invaders were camped across the river from Moscow when unexpectedly they withdrew. Mongol rule was over. Ivan the Great had succeeded in preserving Russia. Meanwhile, the city of Constantinople finally fell in the Muslim hands. The invaders used huge guns, hurled such heavy stones into the city's thick walls that they crumbled in 1453. That was the downfall of Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Now, Ivan the Great determined to fill the void by proclaiming Moscow to be the third Rome, the new center of Christianity, in place of old Rome and Constantinople. So the Tsar moved quickly to establish his empire of church and state. And in harmony with his ambitions for a third Rome, Ivan hired Italian architects to renovate the magnificent Assumption Cathedral. And to safeguard the Kremlin against future assaults, he built a brick wall around the 69 acres as thick as 20 feet, with fortified towers at the corners and towers in between. According to legend, the design included a number of secret tunnels extending beyond the Kremlin walls. Ivan the Great's massive building project occupied 30 years. 
Much of his Italian Kremlin still stands after five centuries. And most spectacular, perhaps, is the Palace of Facets. The main chamber, the most celebrated room in the Kremlin, served both as throne room and reception hall for Ivan and his successors. When President Gorbachev welcomed American President Reagan to the palace chamber in 1988, he maintained a tradition dating back to the Tsar Ivan the Great. Well, after Ivan passed from the scene, the power of the Russian Orthodox Church grew to equal and even exceed the authority of civil rulers. The little Tsars were regarded as God's servants under the guidance of the Church. That lasted until 1721, when Tsar Peter the Great decided that the Church had become too powerful. So he delegated to a political appointee the operation of religion, making it a subservient arm of the state. Nevertheless, until the 20th century, the Russian Orthodox Church still possessed the power to persecute non-Orthodox Christians. But what about religious liberty in the Soviet Union today? In one of our telecasts of this series, we're going to discuss that vital question with a representative of the Soviet government. I think you'll be delighted with what you hear from him. In the meantime, I hope you'll ask for our new book, Comrades in Christ. It has today's message, plus so much more, and it's our gift to you. In a moment, we'll tell you where you can write or call. Thank God, things are changing in the Soviet Union. We see it on the news, we read it in the papers. In fact, recently the Los Angeles Times headlined a story. Bible is a real page turner at Soviet fair. It described the thrilling scene at the Moscow International Book Fair held here at the Exposition Hall behind that gate. A word spread that a Christian publisher was distributing Bibles at its booth. And soon eager crowds had snatched up the supply of 10,000 New Testaments, and more people kept coming. Now it so happened that the American Atheist Association had a booth nearby, featuring none other than Madeleine Murray O'Hare. Evidently Mrs. O'Hare and her friends thought that they would find a welcome among the Soviet people for their godless publications. One was entitled, Trash the Bible. But few seemed interested in trashing the Bible. They'd rather treasure their own copy of God's Word. So there they were, forming long lines that stretched around the corner in front of the American atheist booth. Well, Madeleine Murray O'Hare reportedly became furious. Not only were these citizens of a supposedly atheistic state ignoring her godless propaganda, they were jamming the aisles, blocking her booth in their scramble to get God's word. Near chaos reign, the horrified Mrs. O'Hare summoned authorities and demanded that they control the Bible-hungry crowd. Well, someone climbed onto a table shouting, please stand back, but no. The people of Russia would not be denied their precious Bibles. They'd waited long enough, and now their time had come. With the supply of Bibles gone, 17,000 extra requests came in for Bibles to be sent. Imagine, many pleaded in halting English, will you really send my Bible? Oh, praise God. It's a new day in the Soviet Union, as Madeleine Murray O'Hare discovered. An incredible experience. I find myself not only thrilled, but challenged. How about you? Are we as determined as those Soviet citizens to cherish God's Word? Are we as willing to study its message and walk in the light? Oh, God help us catch on to their enthusiasm and commitment. Shall we pray? Father mine, we praise you for what you're doing in human hearts throughout the Soviet Union. Thousands, even millions, turning to Jesus and his word. Turn our hearts to you as well. Lord, help us during this series of telecasts to treasure your word as never before. And may we live our lives in the light shining from its pages. We ask this in our Savior's name. Amen.
When we first began to think about this project, this trip, it was almost a foregone conclusion that the first telecast would have to be entitled A Dream Come True. What else could we call it? To be right here in Moscow, in the heart of the Soviet Union, with so many precious fellow believers is thrilling beyond description for me. Not only is this turning into an eight-week video adventure, but we poured the entire saga into this brand new book, Comrades in Christ. And it's yours, free, free for the asking. You'll be able to enjoy every word again and again with your own personal copy. Now, please don't write to me over here in Moscow. Write our office back in California and ask for a brand new complimentary copy of Comrades in Christ. Or call if you prefer. It takes just a moment and we'll get a copy into the mail immediately. Now, here is the information you need. As a convenience, you may request the free gift offer by calling our toll-free number, 1-800-253-3000. Call right now. That's 1-800-253-3000. Remember, the offer is sent by mail, free and postpaid. You may have to dial the number more than once, but please keep trying. The operator needs only your name, address, and phone number, and the name of the offer you want. Call toll-free now, 1-800-253-3000. Lines are open now. That's 1-800-253-3000. If you prefer, you may request the offer by writing to George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Thank you for your letters and prayer requests. Well, that's it. A dream come true. But next week, at this same time, be sure to be with us for Holy Devil of the Tsar. Sound interesting? I promise you it will be. But now the time has come all too quickly to say goodbye, everyone. But remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.